Welcome to the Bloomington Rotary Club's weekly celebration of service for April 6th, 2021. I'm your current president, Ashley Wesley. Thank you for being here. Natalie, please show the flag graphic for 15 seconds of respectful silence. We ask that you remain on mute and take this time to personally reflect. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce Martha Wales, who will be offering our reflection today. Martha? Martha, you're muted. Oh, there, you are. there I am, yep. Uh, finally, the federal government agrees we are Hoosiers. Uh, I'm going to read you a column that was written by Maureen Gropi in January of 2017. It's official, we're Hoosiers, not Indianians or even Indianans. So says the federal government on page 95 of the updated US government publishing offices style manual released Thursday, that would have been 1917. The change came at the request of Senator Joe Donnelly and former Senator Dan Coates who argued Indiana residents have proudly called themselves Hoosiers for more than 180 years, even if no one is sure of the term's origins. It's only non-Hoosiers who use the term Indianian. In fact, Donnelly and Coates wrote in a letter last year, we find it a little jarring to be referred to in this way. The senators had good time. Their request was made as the GPO was working on the 31st edition of the manual that has served as the style guide for federal documents since 1894. It's also widely used as an editorial guide by people in the private sector. The updated version lists Hoosier as the term to designate a native of Indiana on a list that starts with Alabamian and ends with Wyomingite. Donnelly says he's pleased the federal government will now call us what we call ourselves. This is a welcome and long overdue change, he said. If you ever had to correct somebody who called you an Indianan, today's the day to celebrate. Senator Todd Young, who succeeded Coates, also praised the move. We aren't achieving world peace here, but it's nice to be recognized by the federal government as Hoosiers, he said. It's not just a classic movie. It's not just the nickname for IU athletics. It's who we are. Plus, Young said in a video announcement with Donnelly, if we can get the federal bureaucracy to agree with us on that, then I feel like there's nothing we can't do. Donnelly and Coates had noted the Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines Hoosier as a native or resident of Indiana. Amtrak's Hoosier state line carries passengers through the Indiana countryside. References to Hoosiers have been found in private correspondence, travel reminiscences, and local newspapers as early as 1826. The term gained popularity after Richmond poet John Finley wrote The Hoosier's Nest, which included these classic lines. The immigrant is soon located in Hoosier life initiated, erects a cabin in the woods wherein he stows his household goods. Coates and Donnelly said the poem, which was widely circulated throughout the country and even abroad in the 1830s, defined and solidified Indiana's identity and instilled pride in the citizens of the still young state. Well, we have become a mature state, still proudly and now officially calling ourselves Hoosiers. Thank you, Martha. All right, we have one guest with us today, a guest of Jim Bright, Kirk White, IU Assistant Vice President. Hi, Kirk, welcome to the club. We hope you'll come back and join us again. And thanks to our producers, Natalie Blaze, Michael Shermis, 
Sally Gaskell and Aaron Davis for helping make this meeting happen. And our roundabout reporter for this week is Susie Graham. A few birthdays to celebrate. Our own reflector Martha Wales is April 8th and Gus Chicalis is April 9th. Megan Gearhart is April 9th as well and Martha Foster is April 11th. Happy birthday. Two membership anniversaries. Board member Ron Barnes, 29 years as a Rotarian. And Matt Stitzinger, five years. Thank you for being a part of the Rotary family. And now for a major celebration, we would like to recognize our newest Paul Harris fellow. Mike Baker, please take it away. Well, somebody's got a tie on today. Anyway, <laughs> oh, don't give that away. Um, as most of you know, the uh, presentation of the Paul Harris Fellow is Rotary Foundation's way of expressing its appreciation for a substantial contribution to the Rotary Foundation and for good service work within the community and the world. Paul Harris Fellow is named after the founder of Rotary, Paul Harris. And it's been harder to talk about why giving to the foundation is such a good thing during COVID and not being in personal meetings. But some of our members continue a little at a time to support the foundation and it's greatly needed. Today, I'm very happy to present the Paul Harris Fellow designation and pin to a current member of our club, Trent Deckard. Trent's support of the foundation will conti uh, continue all the good work Rotary does all over the world and in our own community. Trent arrived in our club just a short period of time ago. What was that a hug? Oh, that's somebody coming over your shoulder there. Okay. Uh, Trent arrived in our club just a short uh, time ago, and he's been helping our club and community in so many different ways. Trent will now join so many in our club and across the world as a Paul Harris Fellow. It's important recognition, and I hope all of you will recognize and celebrate Trent as a Paul Harris Fellow. Please join me in recognizing Trent Deckard as a Paul Harris Fellow. Congratulations, Trent. Thank you very much. And I've got Madeline here to put my pin on me. So thank you for this tremendous honor. And thanks to Kyla, uh, who is a huge supporter of, of me getting to this point. Thank you. Wonderful, it's official. Congratulations. It looks good on you. Okay, we have some Rotarians in the news. President-elect nominee, Alon Barker, was part of an Emeriti House presentation yesterday, Monday, April 5th, entitled the Music Business Peace Initiative. Alon presented along with Timothy Fort, Professor of Business Law and Ethics at the Kelly School, and Constance Cook Glenn, the Director of Music and General Studies at the Jacobs School. So congratulations. Thank that was you. Nice. I'd be happy to tell everybody about it sometime. We'd love to have it. Maybe yeah. you should do a reflection soon. That sounds good. <laughs> and we have a very happy announcement that I couldn't wait for happy dollars. Lauren and Morgan Snyder are new parents again to a baby boy, Lawson James Snyder. He was born Saturday, April 3rd. And their first son, Coleman, is now a proud big brother, as reported by Lauren and Morgan. So congratulations to them. I'm going to include their address in our roundabout, and I'll put it in the chat here. Let's shower them with love. Let's send them lots of cards and congratulations. I'm sure they would appreciate it very much, as now their family of four is on its journey. Remember to sign up for the district conference. It's happening on April 17th. And the more people we get there, the better because we will be entered to win $1,000 for a service project if we have the highest percentage of attendance. So let's show up. Let's hear those speakers and engage in this district conference over Zoom, hopefully for the last time. We'll be in person together uh, next year, fingers crossed. And now, happy dollars. Does anyone have any of their own happy dollars to share? No takers? I'll Allie. share. I'll share. 
Um, I'm happy because yesterday, April 5th, was the sixth anniversary of what I like to call George Shively Day. It's the day when um, six years ago, which was baseball's opening day that year, um, Bob Hamill and the choir of Otis Nove and I and a number of community um, people, including descendants of George Shively, dedicated new tombstones at Rose Hill Cemetery in Shively's honor. He was, of course, a Negro Leagues baseball player who lived and died in Bloomington. I've got one. Go ahead. Oh, hello. Um, uh, I just want to say that um, many of you know that I'm the president of the Buzzkirk Chumley Theater Board, and this year has been particularly challenging for us because the theater has been dark since uh, last March, and we're still waiting for the um, audience limits to be raised enough, but we got, we got news last week that we had qualified for our second PPP loan. And so we're ever more confident that we will be able to, you know, be there when things open up and we're really very much looking forward to it. Good. All right. And I've got okay. 10 happy dollars for an incredible Rotarian and a wonderful person who's got their birthday coming up on the 11th, Martha Foster. <laughs> Why, thank you. I was just going to put in some happy dollars for uh, visits from uh, Aaron's oldest son and my daughter in the past uh, week and a half. And it's just been absolutely wonderful to be able to see our kids in person and drive around in the same car and have them stay with us. So there is life beyond, uh, you know, post vaccinations, everyone. It's very good. Thank you. I have one. I have one. I have, I, I have. Ten happy dollars for, in memory of Patrick O'Meara, who spoke to the club a few weeks ago, or some time ago, and who was a really wonderful member of of, of, of our community and of the universe, uh, Indiana University. So in memory of Patrick, I, I have happy dollars. And I'm going to do the same. He was a dear, dear man. He was the first person I met in Bloomington when I when I first arrived. A South African. <laughs> I will give a dollar for the most wonderful and historical performance of the IU women basketball this year. Yes. I have uh, one. I'll, I'll actually throw in uh, $10, maybe a few more, but I want to congratulate the IU United Way campaign, which exceeded their goal, as is being reported in the news. And particularly one of our guests, Kirk White, was an absolute huge part of that. And we're just, all of us in that United Way family and beyond are very grateful for that leadership from Kirk and others. So congratulations, United Way and IU. I would like to donate $5 um, in honor of um, the gradually decreasing number of days when it will be quiet because when the ground hits 64 degrees, out will come the 17 year locusts. Yes. They were over <laughs> for a month and a half. Thanks for the and, reminder, Owen. <laughs> and I've got another 10 happy dollars for the person who registers and bills us for our happy dollars and who does so much for this club, uh, Natalie Blaze. Here, here. All right, any other takers? All right, thank you for sharing all those happy moments and some sad um, in memory, but thank you for sharing. Without further ado, Michael Shermis, please introduce our speaker for today. I'm thrilled to uh, introduce uh, our speaker because I had a, a conversation prior to uh, uh, setting him up to speak today, and uh, I was fascinated, um, besides obviously being really smart, it was just really interesting to know all the ins and outs of uh, what's going on in, the, in Russia and how it relates to us, and, uh, uh, and so I think you're going to enjoy this. So um, our speaker today is Colonel Stephen J. Lacey. He's a United States Army War College Fellow at Indiana University's Russian and East European Institute. 
He is an Army Strategic Intelligence Officer from East Winnetouche, uh, Washington, who received his commission in 1999. He's also a graduate of the Transportation Office Basic Course, Logistics Officer Advanced Course, Commander and General Staff College, Joint Foreign Officers Orientation Course, Strategic Intelligent Officer Course, Joint Military Intelligent Officer Course, Defense Strategy Course, and the Joint and Combined Warfighting School. Prior to his arrival in Bloomington, Indiana, he was uh, assigned to United States European Command uh, headquarters in Stuttgart, Germany, where he served as the Chief Northern and Eastern European Intelligence Security Cooperation uh, Branch, responsible for promoting intelligence integration capacity and interoperability with over 25 nations. He is a Russian military subject matter expert with extensive experience in Eastern Europe and Eurasia. He holds an undergraduate degree in Russian and speaks fluent Russian and has multiple years of in-country experience in Ukraine and Belarus. He holds master's degree from the George Washington University Business and the National Intelligence University, um, as well as a Juris Doctor from the College of William and Mary's Marshall Wythe School of Law. The list of his pre previous assignments, awards, and decoration other honors are, honors are too lengthy to list, uh, but if you get the point that we're dealing with someone who is well pedigreed to talk to us about this topic, you're paying attention. Without further ado, again, Colonel Stephen Wilson. Thank you. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. It's nice to be with you. Um, I'll get right to my presentation because we have limited time. And I think uh, the most interesting thing that we can typically do is have a uh, conversation or discussion at the end. So let me see if I can share screen properly. Um, oh, I did it. Look at that. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Let's see if I can get. There we go. Okay. So I'm going to go through this and if I hope you can everyone hear me thumbs up if you can. Okay, good. Uh, and if you have questions at the end, um, please address them then. Um, I'm sure there's a chat function also, but I'm going to try to run through this. I actually timed myself to make sure I could stay in color within the lines in 20 minutes. So I'll see what I can do. So you have my background, you know um, who I am. Uh, I've been doing this for a long time and uh, this is my, my passion. I've spoken to a number of groups about Russian strategic issues and, and uh, most of them are NATO allies, but, but others as well. So we'll, we'll talk about that. So um, here's the agenda I'm going to talk about today. So these are the slides I have. I'm gonna talk about a little bit of a background to Russia's current situation. I don't know what you know about Russian history and I'll try to be brief. That's its own lecture, but I'll be cursory and talk about how it relates to the current situation. Um, the goals of Russia's grand strategy um, for those who um, have studied Clausewitz or in the military, we talk a lot about ends, ways, and means. Um, so I'm going to discuss what the grand strategy is, um, Russia's sphere of influence, the ways that Russia employs to accomplish that strategy, the means that it employs, some Russian fissures or areas of weakness that um, you might want to note, uh, countering Russian interests. So how would someone counter those interests if they ran counter to either the US government or one of our allies or partners, and then time for discussion. So that's what we'll do. So here's the background I have. Uh, the first thing that I would tell someone in you know, two minutes or less of what they need to know about Russia is to understand a few things in their historical perspective. So I'll try to run through this slide as quickly as possible, but I think it's critically important to understand if you're, you're not a um, Russian specialist. The first is that Russia was the one country that is often considered part of Europe that did not um, that did not enter the Enlightenment party. They had a completely different road to development than most of Europe. They didn't accept Roman Catholicism. They ended up with Christianity through the Byzantine Empire, um, and then later were conquered by the Mongols, as some were um, in Eastern Europe, and were under that Mongol yoke for a few centuries. Um, which made it difficult for them to have the same intellectual development as a civilization that others did. They, I, I call it coming late to the party. In addition, they have been in one of those geostrategic locations as a land power where they've constantly been through their uh, history invaded by other nations from each, just about each direction except the north. Um, no one, polar bears have not come down to the Arctic to invade in mass yet. Uh, but they've had people, they've had Mongols from the East, they've had the Swedes, Poles, um, French, 
uh, Germans from the West, from the South, they've had the Ottomans and Persians, and they, they've had enemies on all sides and they have no natural border defenses. So that permeates Russian mindset of both not having the same level of development we had in the West for um, democracy and also having the challenge of uh, having to have a state focused on security historically. In the 20th century, um, they reached their apex. People don't realize this unless they think about it, but the Russian empire though quite large was not as large as what Soviet sphere of influence was after World War II. Um, after the Soviets um, did their best to conquer uh, Nazi Germany, they kept those satellite states as you, you all are aware of in um, Central and Eastern Europe and did not relinquish control. Um, and so that sphere of influence in the 20th century was large and that's part of the Russian mindset that that, was, that apex happened recently. In the 21st century, um, the challenges that we have with Russia stem from a few issues. The first was is that after um, the fall of the Berlin Wall and then um, the fall of the USSR, NATO slowly expanded into countries in Eastern Europe. That was very frustrating to Russia who was powerless to stop it early on. So in the late 90s, when you had countries like um, uh, Hungary and Romania and others that started getting NATO membership, Russia couldn't do anything about it. And then in, in uh, a few things started to change. In 2004, the Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, and I'll have a map later if you're not exactly sure where those are, uh, they joined NATO in 2004. And uh, those were the first post-Soviet um, satellite states of the USSR that, that joined NATO. And that was highly problematic, but Russia was not in a powerful position to counter that move. In addition, um, the Russian populace in the 90s was very pro-American despite what you may have heard. And then a couple of things started to change. One was that NATO expansion, but the other was in 1999 when we had military operations in uh, former Yugoslavia in the Balkans. Um, the bombing of Belgrade was something that really turned Russian attention and, and Russian reaction against the United States. Um, Russia has always protected Serbia. They went to war and, you know, World War I happened largely because Russia supported Serbia and they have always had interest in that region and, and kind of looked at themselves as protectors of Serbia and have strong ties. And that was on Russian television and caused a lot of consternation. Um, then later in 2008, something happened which was monumental. Um, despite all this NATO expansion that caused trouble um, for Russia in, in its mind, the, uh, there was a NATO, uh, the 20th anniversary of, it's a 20th NATO summit that happened in Bucharest, uh, Romania in April of 2008. And at that meeting, um, the NATO allies agreed and had a public statement that said that they welcomed Ukraine and Georgia's Euro-Atlantic aspirations for membership to NATO. And they agreed to, at that time that those countries would become eventual members of NATO. Russia flipped out. That, that caused all sorts of problems. In fact, I argue that that led to the war in Georgia in 2008. In my slide, I talk about asymmetric balancing. And so what happened as a result of all those issues is when after Putin came to power in 1999, the Russian military was in bad shape. So he decided to lead a Russian military modernization effort. So they poured tons of money into modernizing their military. Lots and lots of money for that. And uh, at the same time realized that they couldn't counter NATO toe to toe militarily, even if they wanted to. So they embarked on what people call asymmetric balancing. And so that meant things like large scale cyber attacks in Estonia, using what you've heard, little green men or small invasions of countries that, um, that led to frozen conflicts. And so those are all tools that Russia used because it couldn't go toe to toe with others. So, when I talk about Russia's grand strategy, um, the Russian elite, and this is a broad term, right? Who is Russia's elite? I don't have time to define that. But there's broadly three main objectives that most scholars and um, professional analysts think that Russia has. The first is for Russia to be recognized as a great power. So the Russian government wants to be recognized as a great power. And that implies if you're a great power that you have a distinct sphere of influence. So in the US, you know, you might remember from your history classes when you were younger, 
that, um, you know, we talk about walking softly and carrying a big stick and we had the Monroe Doctrine and there was a sphere of influence that the US felt it had in this hemisphere. China currently feels it has a sphere of influence and it doesn't like when foreign actors meddle. And Russia feels the same way that if it's a great power, it should have a sphere of influence. And it feels that it should have predominance within that sphere of influence. And the third is a desire to see US influence curbed or scaled back. So Russia views the US as its main competitor and it views it these things as a zero sum game, which means that if we lose, they win, right? If they can reduce our influence or our standing in the world, they increase their own. And if you understand that mindset, a lot of these things tend to fall into place. So those are three broad objectives. And it should be noted that Russia doesn't look at, at a big difference between the US and NATO. It recognizes that the US is about 70% of all of NATO spending. We're, we, we are in the US NATO, we keep it all, we're the glue that keeps it all together. And, uh, and so when it looks at NATO, it recognizes there are all these nations, but we're the predominant force. And so it, it doesn't distinguish much between um, us and NATO unless it can drive a wedge there. Okay, so what's Russia's sphere of influence? It's really four main areas, and I hope you're still awake as I talk about this. The first is the former Soviet Union, right? So you might remember from your time in school, living through the Cold War as we did, um, what the former Soviet states are. And on this map, they were the three Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Belarus, Ukraine. And then you can see some of the Caucasus states there. Russia considers that proprietary, that's its space. Doesn't like the fact that the Baltic states are part of NATO, it can't do anything about that and it kind of recognizes it, right? So it just, I don't wanna say it writes that off but it recognizes that's a separate category. Belarus and Ukraine, for instance, are completely different. The Western Balkans is another area. So I mentioned Serbia, um, that's non-proprietary, right? It recognizes there are other actors that have activities there, but Russia maintains strong influence in the Balkans. And uh, this is an area that it considers its general sphere of influence. It likes to counter and check other aspirations there when possible. So when those nations there want NATO membership, Russia will have subversive activities to try to counter that. Um, a few years ago, it was well publicized that they um, interfered in elections in um, uh, North Macedonia. Uh, they, they've tried to do things to stop NATO aspirations of those countries because they consider that an area of their interest. The Black Sea is another. Um, the Russians consider the Black Sea their lake, heavily militarized. They have all sorts of naval vessels there with great capability. Um, the Turks, the Bulgarians, and Romanians, who are all NATO allies, have a fraction of what Russia does. And then when foreign warships like ours come in, we have destroyers that come in periodically and do um, freedom of navigation uh, sails through there. Those ships are always shadowed. They're always uh, without by other vessels. The Russians will do simulated strikes against them, um, all sorts of things. So they, they consider that their territory and they let us know. And then finally, the Eastern Mediterranean. So that's not Russia's unique personal um, space but they have a strong interest there and they let us know. So when US ships are there, um, the Russians have a strong presence and they let that be known partially because they have a, a naval base in Syria, in Tartus, that this is an area that's their particular sphere of influence. Okay, so Russia's grand strategy, what are the ways? So the ways that Russia tries to implement their strategy are generally the following, okay? So these are, these are this is my view and some might take some issue, but these are the general ways. The first is they want to divide NATO and EU or US cohesion. So they, they like whenever possible to divide the alliance. If they can do it politically, if they can do it in the information sphere by spreading bad information, they love that. Um, but politically they do this a lot. They like to divide Germany and the United States or the French and the Germans. If they can, if they can divide NATO so that's not a cohesive group or divide the EU so it doesn't have a, a a unified policy, or just create havoc, they're happy. The second is, generally speaking, to undermine Western credibility. Russian media loves to show their system of government, which is more autocratic, as an alternative way to Western democracy. They, for Russian television, which you might see abroad, if you're, you know, you might have it at your house or on a hotel room when you travel, they love to talk about how even African nations, which are a complete mess in their mind, um, have Western democracy. That democracy doesn't do you any good. Democracy is just a mess. In the US, they're always showing racial strife, 
I can, they, they made heyday in early January with the activities that happened in the Capitol. They love to show that, that we're a hot mess. So any problem in the West, they like to highlight as C. These guys don't have it together. We have an alternative way. Um, and that creates disunity and, and provides support for Russia. The other is state capture. So state capture implies that um, when you have a smaller nation that Russia can either politically dominate through uh, a debt trap where that country owes Russia so much money or so indebted through oil sales or something that Russia has de facto control. Or in the case of Ukraine before 2014, um, where they owned the oligarch that was in charge. So the president of the country was kind of their guy. They paid him off. Um, they can do that. That's also a form of state capture. So those are ways the Russians often employ. They love to foment instability in the US and Europe. And for those who don't realize it, the Russians are very active and have been active for decades in trying to foment instability in the US and Europe. I can only talk about some of that, but much of it you've seen. They spread lots of disinformation here. Um, They'll have political groups that are legitimate groups and they will channel money to those groups to, so if you have a, a group with a legitimate grievous, grievance, um, some of you lived through the 60s, remember there were student groups that were protesting the Vietnam War. Research has shown that uh, although student groups were legitimate groups, but a lot of them got money from um, Soviet fronts for their activities. So in the words of Billy Joel, they didn't start the fire, but they love to fan the flames. And that's something that they do in the US and Europe a lot. Finally, um, territorial issues and frozen conflicts, that's been a favorite play in their near abroad where um, they do it in Ukraine now, they do it in Georgia, um, with Moldova. They like to have little slices of territory that they're liberating and then they, uh, they end up kind of quasi owning it. Um, with the exception of Crimea, Russia typically doesn't want to own the real estate. So they want to pay for it. They just want to cause trouble there and make it difficult for, for another country to either come into NATO or um, be closely aligned to the West. So what are the means, right? So the first that you might be aware of is energy influence. Russia is an oil and gas state. They're a petro state. Their government is funded by oil and natural gas. It's where they get most of the revenue. But it's a declining mean. And I say that because um, they have not been modernizing their oil fields and their pipelines as much as they should. And so they have difficulty producing what they should. There's a lot of discussion about how Russia's infrastructure is declining in um, petrochemicals. And so this is something to watch in the future. Um, they're just not putting the money in for modernization that they should. And because of sanctions, they can't have Western companies come in and help them modernize. Other means is disinformation and propaganda. They're the best. Um, I'm writing one of my uh, large papers here is on Russian disinformation and propaganda, and they're exceptional at it. And the more and more you dig into the research, the more you realize how good they are at it. Um, even when we're aware of it, sadly, we are not countering that probably the way we could. And they spend lots and lots of money on even externally just on disinformation and propaganda to sow discontent and, and hate, frankly. Um, cultural diplomacy, which includes religions, the Russian Orthodox Church or cultural centers are a way that they, they use to achieve their means military activity. So military um, operations are one like in Syria, but they also have military exercises with partner nations or in their near abroad that cause all sorts of um, tension and discontent. And then uh, technical assistance to autocrats. So in Africa, particularly that we see now, um, they'll have some strong man there and the Russians will send technical advisors or contractors down there to help him, you know, stay in power. And uh, that assistance is looked at favorably by some of these governments who are looking for an alternative to US democracy. And I finally put strategic nuclear arsenal as a means because it should be remembered that Russia remains the only country in the world that, that is a true existential threat to the United States. Their nuclear arsenal is vast and um, very capable. And uh, that's always something that's in the back of everyone's mind. That's why we treat Russia the way we do as a, as a peer, because they have a nuclear arsenal. If they didn't, I think they would be treated differently by many people. Okay, so Russian fissures and areas of weakness. And I'm sorry, I'm running through this so quickly, but I wanna make sure there's time for discussion. Um, there's da scarce data, but 
there is some evidence um, and some research by the State Department and others that, that Russian elites view domestic problems um, as more important than great power competition, which the Kremlin cares about. So this is an area um, that I think could be exploited in the future, um, but it's certainly an area of weakness where Russian elites recognize there are domestic problems in Russia um, and there's dissatisfaction and they care a little more about that than they do than I think um, President Putin and, and some other of the, the um, Russian security services care about great power competition. Akin to that is Russia's domestic economy is very, very weak. Um, its consumer economy lags behind. Lots of people, including China, still depending on petrochemicals, um, but it's resilient. And, and since we've had sanctions in about 2014, Russia's economy has been very resilient in doing what they call import substitution, where they've managed to take, particularly in this, the realm of agriculture, um, instead of importing food from you know, Europe, they've, they've developed ways that their manufacturers can produce the same thing. And so they've been pretty resilient. That doesn't make the population particularly happy, but it means that they weather sanctions pretty well. And so people who think sanctions are going to solve all our problems are, I think, a little misguided. Um, and uh, finally, Russia has not achieved its goals in Ukraine. Their invasion of Ukraine, I think, has actually unified Ukraine somewhat, which was an unexpected outcome, I think, from um, Russian strategic goals. OK, so how do we counter Russian influence if, if we want to, right? How does one do that? So these are, these are Steve Lacey's ideas, right? Um, I actually stole them from other people, but I won't, ref, I won't cite them so you can assume that they're mine. Uh, but, and I have to also say, I should have said up front that these are my personal views and not the, the views of the Department of Defense or um, the US government or anyone with a better haircut than I have. So just recognize that uh, these are my thoughts, but, I, but there's a number of academics and analysts who agree with me. Uh, first is exposing propaganda and disinformation efforts. If there's anything that I think we all could contribute to, it's that effort. Um, Russians do this a lot. They even have, this is publicly available knowledge now, uh, they have a number of these type of sites, but there's one outside of St. Petersburg. The Russians actually had in 2016, when they were interfering with our election, a, um, they call the Internet Research Agency. And they have a little building outside in the suburbs of Petersburg that's about 200 people who work in a building who do nothing but sow um, propaganda and disinformation. They're basically internet um, trolls who, who go out there and spread disinformation and lies. Can you imagine like 200 people who that's their sole job is to spread false narratives. And that's just one group. Um, and no one does anything about it, really. So it's, uh, it's something that we could do more of. The second is strengthening our transatlantic partnerships or alliances. Uh, we need to do more of this. So um, somebody asked me a question in the breakout room about what I thought about certain US policies, which I can't publicly comment on. But what I can say is that Strengthening transatlantic partnerships like NATO are hugely important. They mean a lot to our allies and they do a lot to protect um, all of us from these narratives. Um, I have found that even when there's political problems with between ourselves and another country that I've worked with, that when I'm working with my military intelligence counterparts that are because we're all in the same NATO club, we can get a lot done at our level that people can't get done in diplomatic missions. Um, that there are problems there that because of political issues can't be solved, but we can work on issues that sort of keep the conversation alive. And that's, those alliances have so much value at so many different levels of government and, and quite frankly, in the private sector. Um, another way is to encourage energy diversification in Europe. It's really important that, that Russian energy is not the sole source of energy in parts of Eastern and Central Europe. And so that diversification is really important. So that leverage isn't there. And then finally, observing Russian-Chinese relations. That's an interesting one because when the Russians and Chinese have competition amongst themselves, it takes the pressure off with us. So I think that's an important one to, to uh, recognize in the big picture. OK, I timed myself 22 minutes. Michael, I think I, I think I did a pretty good job of keeping within, coloring within the lines. So I'm going to open it up to questions, whoever you want to do that, Michael. And, uh, and I'll sit here quietly. Yeah, we can feel free to just people will just kind of raise their hand. Can I ask a quick question or, or yeah, point yeah. out that um, Putin was just uh, a, a elect, or, you know, now going to be dictator for life. I saw it in the news today. 
how, how much of an effect does that have on the Russian people in terms of discouraging, you know, like being in such discouraging news that they're going to be in this situation? Or is it like everybody's just fine with it? I'm just kind of curious. I don't think it's a surprise to anyone there. And as I mentioned to someone who asked me this question before we started, and I just I'll kind of reiterate what I said. The And again, this is my view. Russia has historically and currently does not have a, uh, there's no way for someone like President Putin to have a succession plan. He can't just ride off into the sunset. His personal finances are intertwined with the state. Um, I mentioned a good book that I highly recommend to people if you haven't read it. It's a few years old, it's called Kleptocracy. And uh, I think it was Misha, is it Misha Glennon? I can't remember the author, but it was, it's Kleptocracy. I have it in my shelf. And the, uh, the great thing to understand is that there's no way for someone like President Putin to leave office easily or safely for him and his family. And so I, I, from a pragmatic standpoint, I understand why this was done is that, that in many of these countries around the world who don't have systems like ours, there's no way for there to be a bloodless transition. And, uh, and so I think you just have to recognize the, the real politic nature of, of, of that in Russia. Um, it's all well and good to have a successor, but there has to be a better mechanism for that to occur um, rather than just someone else taking power and then Putin being um, at the whim of potentially people that he's done wrong in the past. So I think that's just something that you have to recognize is that it's, I think the Russian people understand that because that's been their historical perspective. Oh, Got a question? Okay. I have a question. Just one too. second. We have an order here. Owen Johnson was was next. He'd raise his hand. Um, I'm curious. First of all, um, since I grew up in Washington, it's uh, great to have somebody from the Apple capital of the world, the same state that gave us General Mattis. Um, what I'm interested in is an area that you only briefly mentioned at the end. Um, that is the relationship with China. Um, because it has its Belt and Road Initiative, which is cutting on the south part of Soviet interests. And I would also add um, Turkey and Central Asia, uh, all Turkic peoples. Um, my friends in, Af in uh, Azerbaijan um, appreciated Turkish help. They were not uh, happy when Russia came in to um, mediate the uh, Nagorno-Karabakh uh, complex. To what degree um, is that going to affect what's happening in Russia? Those are huge questions. Um, but let me try to answer them as succinctly as I can and give you some wave tops. So with, with China, there is a level of comp that the Russians and the Chinese don't trust one another um, state to state. Um, in fact, when the Chinese buy things from the Russians, there's an understanding that they will reverse engineer military hardware or steal the technology much like they do from us. So uh, I think that there's a natural level of competition there and, an, and a pragmatism in there. It's, things are transactional. So I would describe the relationship as very transactional there. Uh, second, um, when you move into Turkey, and actually my next assignment, I'm going to be the um, Director of Intelligence for NATO's Land Forces Command in Turkey. So I'm actually headed there uh, a few months. And so I'm, I'm particularly interested in Turkey. And what I can say is that that activity, um, I think, shows a growing resurgence on the part of the Turkish government to uh, create and forge closer relationships to other Turkic-speaking peoples in the region and is a counter to Russian influence um, in the area. So it's one to watch. Um, very interesting how that will play out. We've had a lot of tensions you know, between the US and Turkey that have been well publicized, but I think that this is Turkey's way of asserting itself and saying, hey, we're a player too. And so that regionalism will be important. So I think it is worth watching. Uh, it's a good question, but it's, uh, it's certainly a sign that um, Turkey is not willing to be Russia's doormat, put it that way. Judy Schroeder, Judy Schroeder was next. You're muted, Judy. That was the most interesting presentation. Thank you. Um, I have two questions. One is income inequality an issue, issue in Russia? And second, does the US government and other Western ally governments have equivalent troll factories? 
Ooh. Um, let me answer the first, uh, I'll answer those in turn. Uh, I think I can answer both. The first is a great question. Income inequality uh, is always a factor. I think it's a factor in every civil society, but uh, it's less of an issue than it was probably 10 to 15 years ago in that the Russians have come to some, this is my own personal perspective, there's, there's some level of acceptance of the status quo. So in the late 90s and early 2000s, there was a lot written, a lot of frustration by income inequality because it happened so rapidly. And I think there's just, there's a, a level of cynicism that has permeated Russian society. I think that's probably the best word, cynicism toward that. The vast majority of people in Russia um, muddle by. So there are oligarchs or people who, but you're either a have or have not in that society. And quite frankly, most of the haves tend to be centered in places like Moscow or Petersburg. So more than just income inequality, the real problem is there's a huge disconnect between the centers of power and the regions in Russia. So when, when you talk about Russia, you'll see that written, the regions are really important because there's wide discontent in the remote regions of Russia. And Moscow, for anybody who's visited, is not Russia, it's Moscow. It's like coming to the United States and you only visit New York, you're like, oh, this is the US. That's not the US, that's New York, right? Mm -hmm. It's different. And, and it's the same thing with Russia that Petersburg and Moscow are not reflective of the rest of the country, but they hold all the power right now. But there is discontent. And so it's unless, it, rather than just think of it as income inequality, I think of it as regional inequality. Second question about troll factories. Um, I can honestly answer that question is no, we don't operate that way. And the big, and actually I'm delivering a presentation at the school in a few weeks about Russian security services and how they're different from us. Uh, and uh, there's so much written about this that I can talk about it publicly, which is great. But the reality is, is that we're much more defensively minded, which you might think of as a weakness and yet it's a great strength. Our intelligence services are focused on analysis and collection first and foremost. Um, so we are less uh, overtly operational in the way we conduct intelligence. Um, we're a little more passive because we're here to provide our policymakers and our political leaders who we respect. And even if we don't like what they do, we follow their orders. In the Russian system, there's far more competition between security services. So there's a little more what I would call the cowboyish nature. They take things upon themselves and they're offensively oriented. They look at intelligence as an offensive activity rather than a defensive activity, um, which is why I, as a US military officer who's in intelligence, I can say that publicly. In Russia, you would never do that because people would understand that you are acting in an offensive mindset and you're probably focused on counterintelligence and disruption abroad. So it's a completely different way of conducting intelligence. Charlotte, we're the good guys. Up next. <clears throat> okay. I have two things. One may be irrelevant, but what of what was the effect of Catherine the Great on the history of Russia? And the other is is what kind of social network is existent now? Oh, um, I'm not sure I can answer that question properly uh, in the time that we have. What I will say is that the um, the benefit of some of those Russian monarchs, including Catherine, was they provided greater European integration. The downside to Catherine the Great, and I would make this criticism of some of the other um, Russian leaders, is that they did not allow, so I talked about that lack of enlightenment. Yeah. Catherine initially looked like she would be someone who promoted greater integration, but she ended up being a total, more of an autocrat who suppressed intellectual and political development in the country. I think she, like many of the rulers, um, retarded their growth. So I would say that that, that was one of the, the downsides was that she didn't do enough to allow for political development, which in later decades in the next century created problems. And that's that's been a long-term problem in Russia, but that's just my own reading. And I don't remember what the second question was. Social, the social network, the service, social service network. Um, I'm not sure I can adequately answer the, that. I should say the socialist network. The it's socialist a, network? Yeah. yeah. Um, we talk about socialism. Can you be more specific on what you mean by that question? Well, I'm just saying the, the state-operated state, state operated 
support for for everyday life. Oh, I see. So I, I mean, the experience with communism that that uh, communism, Russia had. Yeah. Russia is a much more communal society than ours, and that yeah. causes problems. I think you know this is a broader question, but when we look at other countries, and you know, my career is focused on working with partners and allies. Mm -hmm. The hardest thing for Americans to understand is that we come from a very individualistic society. We are not a communal people. Um, yes. We're certainly not a communal people right now. I think that's pretty evident politically, but, yes. but socially we're not either. Um, and in many of these societies, including Russia, they have always been very communal. Um, Russian landed estates historically were places where you had a land landlord, whether or not he was absentee, and a communal land system that even even after serfdom was eliminated, it was very communal and you had communal councils. So communism was, was easier, I think, to introduce there because it was a communal culture. So places that have communal cultures tend to embrace socialism or communism or their derivatives much more easily than places who have um, a strong sense of individualism like you do in the West. And uh, so I think that was a, certainly a factor. So it continues. Absolutely. Um, but remember, socialism is something that all developed societies have elements of. I don't want to get into too much political discourse, but sure. we have elements of that in our country, and it's not all bad, right? Yes. Uh, 1930s, the New Deal was Satan's yes. plan, yes. according to some people. And now yes. elements of that we love, right? We love some of our social programs. So as societies modernize, I think there's elements of socialism. They're always going to, you know, have yes. a social network. Um, but they're, you know, Western society struggles with, with how much is too much. So. Thank you. Dave Meyer's hand was raised next. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, uh, Colonel Lacey, for your fine presentation. So my quick question is about climate change and uh, its effect on, on Russia, you know, kind of the threat and opportunity it presents to them. Um, and, and what does Vladimir Putin really think about that if he thinks about it at, at all? They do think about it. It's a good question. Um, so the there's a thing called the Northern Distribution Network that you may have heard of. Sometimes it's called the Northern Transportation Network. So the Russians believe they've done an assessment, and this is all publicly available information now, that the Arctic corridor, that is um, the right above Russia, there is an, you know, there's the ocean, many, many seas that are covered with ice much of the year. And with global warming, it's now possible to ship um, goods along that corridor for longer than they could in the past. Russia believes that this is going to be a source of revenue for them somehow. And so it has actually militarized that area and they've had new icebreakers come into the area because they want other countries to ship along that border because it's so much more cost effective than going around through the Straits of Malacca, Suez Canal, if you're trying to ship east to west. And in fact, the Chinese are very interested. Now it hasn't borne a lot of fruit, but there are more transits now than ever before. So that global warming has opened up a sea passage in the North that didn't exist 20 years ago. And Russia is very focused on the Arctic for that reason, because it sees it as a commercial opportunity. Also, when you have global warming in the North and you, you don't know, have seas that are a little more open, there's the potential down the road for drilling technology to access hydrocarbons. But right now, Russia doesn't have the technology to really do that. And with Western san sanctions, that's dead in the water, but they're looking at something in the future to, you know, greater extraction. So that is something they're very focused on. Great question. Colonel Lacey, thank you so much. Do you have a few minutes to stay after our, the close of our presentation to address a few more questions? Yeah, I've got a few more minutes before my next activity, so I'm happy okay. to stay. Okay, well, we need to close our program quickly and then we'll get to the next few questions, but thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I need to quickly draw our next speaker recognition recipient here because um, it's the fourth quarter and it will be Monroe County United Ministries will be our fourth quarter recipient. So we will be giving a donation in your name, uh, Colonel Lacey. And Sally, would you please tell us about next week's program? Next week on Zoom, we will hear from Dr. Amy Hewitt of the University of Minnesota. She'll be talking about direct support professionals and unrecognized essential workforce. Fantastic, that should be great. All right, Natalie, can we have the four-way test to say that together to close out? 
our meeting. Of the things we think, say, and do. First, first the truth, is the truth. Is the truth. Second, second, is it fair, fair, to, fair to all concerned? Third, third, third will, 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 will build friendship, better friendships. Fourth, fourth, will it be beneficial to all concerned? And fifth, is it fun? fun? Yeah. Thank you. I believe Alan Barker was next.